morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor. I go ahead and apologize for my voice. I got, I'm recovering from some allergy stuff. So uh, if you guys will bear with me in my voice as we start today's uh, new series called The Sounds of the Season. How many of you guys have ever been thrown a curveball by God? Okay. Have you ever heard that uh, saying that if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans? Okay. <laughs> Well, um, <clears throat> uh, as I was preparing for this series, um, I was originally preparing to do exactly what Pastor Rory said, which was take some of our common Christmas carols and teach through them, apply them to, through our lives. But the Lord has a, a different plan, okay? So I want to ask you to uh, pray with me um, before I share this message because um, <clears throat> although the title of the series is the sounds of the season, what I've been hearing in my spirit, in my heart, is exactly what I have to share with you uh, today and throughout this month. And it's in my prayer times, I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, what are the sounds in the spirit that you've been hearing from me? The Lord kind of changed this around with me because he gave me the title, Sounds of the Season. But now he's asking me the question in my private times, what are the sounds that you've been hearing from my voice? What have I been speaking to you in your quiet times that now I want you to share with the church? Okay, so that's what I'm going to share with you today, uh, just from my heart about what God has been speaking to me personally and in my private alone times with him. So would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the word that you've given me to share. I thank you, God, for what you are saying. Lord, we want to be people who listen to your voice and just do what you say, to live in complete obedience to you. So I'm taking that, and I'm doing it today, and I trust you, Lord, for the outcome that you desire. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. 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 I hear the sound, not only of that cell phone, <laughs> but I hear the sound of Jesus coming soon. I hear the sound of the Holy Spirit saying the return of Jesus is coming quickly. I hear the sound of the Holy Spirit in saying to us, the time is near, and I want you to prepare yourself, and I want you to prepare your church for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is coming soon. He's coming personally. He's coming visibly. He's coming with some sounds that I'm going to share with you a little bit later, but he's coming to establish his kingdom. Not only that, I hear the sound of a coming great spiritual awakening to the church. I'm hearing the sound across our land as our world descends into greater and greater darkness. With the great deception happening among the church and among uh, the people of the earth. Deceptions, wars, natural disasters increasing in frequency and increasing in power. We see a moral decline. We see the persecution of God's people increasing all around the earth. And the church of the living God, although the times will be darker and darker as we move ahead, the church, because of Jesus shining through it, Will, go, will grow brighter and brighter and more powerful than the church has ever been before. That's one of the sounds that I'm hearing in the Spirit. Not only that, I hear the sound of great Holy Spirit power falling again on the church. The Bible declares in Joel chapter 2 and also again repeated in the book of Acts 
that in the last days, what's going to happen? God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, upon all people. God says, I'll pour out my spirit. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and even your young men and your old men. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I hear the sound of Holy Spirit power coming again in a fresh way to the church of Jesus Christ. I hear the sound of revival. I hear the sound of renewal. I hear the sound of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. I hear the sound of revival praying. God's people learning how to travail and to pray from their hearts and not just go through religious motions, but praying in the spirit for God's power to show up again. I hear that in the spirit. I hear the sound of an unprecedented move of God like we've never, ever seen before, bringing about countless numbers of salvations. Bringing about miraculous healings, like one like we heard about earlier this morning. Bringing about miracles and life change that we've never, ever seen before. There will be an increase in these things as we move into the days, of head, the days ahead. And this move of God, and this is really important, it's not going to be contained within the walls of church building. This move of God is not to be contained, but God is going to begin moving powerfully in the streets. He's going to move powerfully in the parks, in the community places, in the malls, in the shopping centers, uh, in the the movie theaters, in the office, in the workplace, and at the coffee shops. Come on, somebody. God is going to move at Starbucks. I hear the sound of young people. I hear the sound of the next generation surrendering their lives completely sold out to Jesus. Becoming radical followers, disciples who know how to hear the voice of God and do what he's telling them to do. These young people will have absolutely no tolerance for spiritual hype for manipulation, for manufacturing something. They will have no tolerance for that, but they want only the real thing. Only an authentic move of God. Only the true bread that comes down from heaven. I hear the sound of not only our young people in in revival, but also our older generation falling on their knees to rekindle their passion For Jesus Christ as their first love. I hear them being used of God to impart wisdom, to impart knowledge and experience into the younger generation. And I hear that older generation not retiring, but refiring their passion for God. I hear the sound of his church being so dedicated, so devoted, so sold out for him that, our, that the church, not just our church, but the church of Jesus Christ in general becoming unshakable, unmovable, unstoppable, Holy Spirit propelled force in this earth. <clears throat> and I hear the Holy Spirit inviting us to be a part of it. I hear the Holy Spirit passionately inviting us in. And you know what he's he's saying? He's saying, will you join me? The Holy Spirit is saying, will you join me? Will you fall in love with Jesus again? Will you join God the Father in what he wants to do in these last days before the return of his son? Will you join me? Will you partner with me? Will you get serious? Because Jesus, the bridegroom king is coming again, and he's coming very soon. Amen? Amen. You guys still with me? This is not exactly a cute, feel-good Christmas message, is it? (laughs) 
Now, Christmas, <clears throat> over 2,000 years ago when Jesus came the first time, there were hundreds of prophecies given throughout the scripture about his coming. For, for example, the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, prophesied in the Old Testament. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. The Messiah would be preceded by a messenger named John the Baptist. It was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. The Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a, on a donkey's colt. It was prophesied and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus. The Messiah would be betrayed by a friend. Listen to the details that Jesus fulfilled all of these precise prophecies. <clears throat> the betrayal would be for 30 pieces of silver prophesied by the prophet Zechariah. The money would be used to purchase the potter's field. Prophesied again by the prophet Zechariah, the Messiah would die a sacrificial death for us. Prophesied by Daniel and Isaiah, he would die a criminal with criminals, but his but his burial would be with the wealthy. He was buried in a borrowed tomb of a wealthy man. That was prophesied in Isaiah. He would rise from the dead. Again, we see that in the book of Psalms in Isaiah. He would say certain words on the cross. <clears throat> he would be mocked. He would be unrecognizable. People would gamble for his clothes. These were all prophetic words given in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ personally fulfilled. <clears throat> and many other prophecies could be listed that were perfectly fulfilled in Christ. But listen, these were not lucky guesses. <clears throat> they were precise predictions inspired by the all-knowing God who knows the past, the present, and the future perfectly. Consequently, this is what I want you to catch. We can be completely confident that God always makes good on his promises. He is faithful, and he will always follow through with what he says. In those future events that are still yet to come, like the second coming of Jesus, and like all the biblical signs of the times that are explained throughout the Bible, we can rest assured that those things will certainly come to pass. They will come to pass just like he said. Why? Because God is faithful. He is not a man that he should lie. <clears throat> I want you to hear the sound of the season today with me. Would you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and hear the sound of what the Lord is saying? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a what? A loud command or a shout. Do you hear the sound? With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Do you hear the sounds? And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will forever be with the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say, encourage one another with these words. I want to encourage you, church, my brothers and sisters, with these words today. Jesus Christ is going to return again to this earth. And his return is very soon. So if you're going through a difficult time in this Christmas season, if you're going through storms right now, if you're, go if you're facing things that you've never thought you'd face before, I want you to have hope. If you can't have hope in anything else, you can have hope in Jesus Christ. And you can have hope that he will return again very, very soon. And when it comes to the return of Christ, it's not going to be a secret thing. It's not going to be a quiet thing. In fact, he's going to return in great power and great authority and with many tremendous 
sounds. Everybody say sounds of the season. <clears throat> return with a loud command. A shout. <clears throat> he return with the voice of that archangel thundering through the atmosphere. He return, he the, we'll hear the sound of the trumpet call of God. And Jesus will return again with such power and such authority to start to establish his kingdom upon this earth. Now, there's some things that we need to understand. And just I want you to take notes with me. Go ahead and jot these down uh, with me. Number one is this. We all need to know that God desires everyone to be saved. He desires everyone to be saved. Look at John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Wow, what a promise. That is the message of the gospel right there encapsulated in this one verse. And I want you to notice this morning that there are no limitations in the word whoever. Whosoever, whoever believes in him. This is an all-inclusive word. In, in other words, you don't have to come from a certain background. You don't need a certain skin color. You don't need to have uh, tattoos or not tattoos. It doesn't, none of that matters. None of that matters. It's an all-inclusive word. In other words, everybody Every single person on earth is eligible to come to Jesus. And when you come to Jesus, you receive that gift of eternal life. And that is beautiful and powerful. The invitation goes out to all. Repent of your sins and believe upon Jesus. Turn from your sins and receive Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. Bring your sin to the cross in faith. And know that Christ died there on your behalf so that you might be forgiven, you might be set free, and you might be a child of the living God. Every single person who sincerely turns to Christ for salvation is granted that gift. <clears throat> That's God's heart. He wants every single person to be saved. And you know what you don't find? <clears throat> You don't find people saying, I turned to God in repentance and faith, but he rejected me. You don't find people saying, he didn't want me. I wasn't good enough. <clears throat> that sort of thing doesn't happen. But sadly, what does happen is that there are millions of people who choose to continue to, living, to live their lives without Christ. <clears throat> it's their choice, but it's not God's choice for them. It's not God's heart. His choice and his heart was displayed upon that old rugged cross. His desire for everyone is eternal life, but God does not make robots. He does not make robots. It is your choice. It is my choice to believe. He makes human beings, some of which Respond to his love and some of which choose not to respond to his love. But God desires every single person to know him and to be saved. Number two is this. God has a plan to reach the world. The world. God has commissioned his church to be a vehicle of his message. To spread the gospel. To spread the good news about Jesus and his plan is to use us, to use your neighbor, to use one another, to use every born again child of God to be a vehicle to spread his word to other people. We call this the Great Commission, found in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. It says this Jesus came and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has a plan. And that plan is to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And did you know that he wants to use you to do that? Felt like God gave me a specific challenge for all the men in the room. If you're a man, come on, wave at me. All right, tell me you're, tell me you're listening to me. In these last days, I believe that God is looking for men. Men with humble hearts. Men who will sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ. Who will stand in the gap and be servant leaders in their churches, in their families, in their marriages. Think, ab- think about this. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... It, this whole thing started by Jesus calling a few men to follow him. His concern was not with programs to reach people, but with men whom people would follow. Men were to be were a key part in Jesus' plan to reach the world for God. And somewhere along the line, I don't know exactly how it happened. But many Christian men have become beaten down and even emasculated and discouraged and despaired. And they have even, some of us have forgotten what it even means to be a man. But I believe in these last days, God's going to turn that around. And God's going to be looking for men of God to actually be men of God. Again, and it's time for the men to rise up and be men because a changed man will influence a marriage. A changed man will influence a family. And a changed family will influence a neighborhood and a community. And a changed community will influence a state or a nation. And a a changed nation will help change the world But it all begins with a changed man. Come on, men of God. It's time to be men. Next point is this. God is waiting for the completion of his plan to return. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then, look at that word. There's a time frame. There's a condition to this. Then the end will come. God is waiting for the completion of his plan, for, the, for his gospel to go out to the entire world, to reach every single person, and then... The end will come. Look at this verse in 2 Peter, verse 3. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Look at this. He is patient with you. Why? Why? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. This is going to happen. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, here's the question for us today. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. And speed is coming. So, the question is, and I just want us to ponder this in the next few minutes. How are we to live? If we are really living in the last days and the end times and Jesus is in fact coming very soon, how does that affect our lives? How does that affect our church? 
How does that affect the way that we spend our time? How does that affect the way that we spend our money? How does that affect the way that we make decisions? How does that affect our prayer lives? How does that affect our lives in relationship with other people? Look at Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Paul, the Apostle Paul says this. <clears throat> Actually, let me back up. The first one is this. See the significance of every single day. How are we going to live in these, un- in these end times? We've got to know the significance, the importance, the value of every single day. Why? Because the Apostle Paul said this in, in uh, Ephesians 5. Be careful then. How you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Everybody say every opportunity. (laughs) Because why? The days are evil. Because the days are evil. When opportunity knocks, it's too late to prepare. You guys catch that? When opportunity knocks, it's too late to prepare. That's why I believe that the Lord is giving me this message to share with you guys now is that so we can be prepared. We can be a prepared church to live in the end times. We can be a prepared church anticipating the great coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when opportunity knocks, it is too late to prepare. Every God opportunity has a shelf life and we must be prepared for the opportunity that hasn't knocked yet. But it's coming. And we need to hear the words. We need to hear the sounds. We need to hear the truth that Jesus Christ is coming and we need to see the significance of our prayer life. We need to see the significance of our, of our private devotion, our personal dedication to God. Are we really loving him with all of our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength? We need to see the significance of that because why? It's our preparation. It's our strengthening. It's our power. It's our encouragement. It's important to see the significance of every single day. And to see the significance even of our church life, of how we're involved with other people. To see the significance of our serving, our giving, our small group in, involvement. In every, in every single day, in every single moment, we have an opportunity to make a difference and to be prepared for his coming. The second thing is this. Not only do we need to see the significance of every single day, if, as we're living in these end times, but also we need to be very intentional about sharing the unconditional love of Jesus, sharing his love, having a heart of compassion, reaching out to those who are hurting and lost, reaching out to those who do not know the Lord yet. We need to hear the sound of the season, church, and wake up. We need to grow in our compassion for others, love the people around us with the love of God, no matter what, no strings attached. There's no room for hatred. There's no room for racism. There's no room for bigotry. There's no room for hypocrisy. It's just the pure love of Jesus Christ, full of grace and full of truth. Now, it doesn't matter how you, you treat me. This is one of my personal mottos. It doesn't matter how you treat me. It doesn't matter what you say about me. It do, I'm not here to please you anyway. I'm here to please the Lord. So it doesn't matter how you treat me. You can backbite me. You can say slanderous things about me. You can betray me. You can, you can do anything you want to. But that does not change the fact that I will love you with the love of God. I will love you with the love of God. <clears throat> and nothing that you can do can change that. <clears throat> I'm going to love you whether you like it or not. There was a guy who, uh, who had an uh, experience with God. He was a uh, prophetic man. Heard the Lord speak many, many times. But um, he had an experience. It was like a near-death experience where um, the Lord took him to heaven. And he describes what he saw, and he describes a conversation that he had 
with the Lord Jesus. And he, and he said something very shocking uh, happened to him in that conversation. The Lord Jesus didn't ask him, you know, how many devils did you cast out? How many miracles did you perform? Did you do this or did you do that? What, what the Lord asked him is this, have, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? <clears throat> this is on the heart of God. This is the heart of Jesus. Have we learned to love one another? Have we learned to love our brothers and our sisters? Have we learned to really authentically love them and see them through the lens of God? Have we learned to love? Jesus said it this way in John chapter 13. He said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Amen. So again, number two is this. We've got to be intentional about sharing that unconditional love of Jesus with the world. And number three is this. If we're going to be effective and prepared to live in these end times, we've got to be committed to supply the Great Commission. Yes. Supply the Great Commission. What's the Great Commission? It's that verse that's found in Matthew 28, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them. This is the Great Commission. We preach the gospel to the whole world, and then the end will come. Are you committed to the Great Commission? Are you committed to supplying the Great Commission with your service? with your resources, with your time, with your energy, with your prayers? Are you committed to supplying the Great Commission? This is the sound of the season. Are you guys still with me? <clears throat> I've been praying that God would break my heart over and over again for the harvest, for lost people, for hurting people in our community in our neighborhood who need eternal life, who need hope, who need encouragement. And God has been working in my life. And, I'm, and again, I'm not satisfied with where we are as a church. I'm not satisfied when I see empty chairs. I'm not satisfied with only one service on, on the weekends when we could have multiple services. Like, I've, I'm okay with lots of elbow room and, and lots of space in the movie theaters, but I'm not okay with it at church because people need to be in church, not just this church, but the, the, the church in general. People need to be in church seeking after God, engaging in worship, participating together with other brothers and, and other sisters to find encouragement, to find support. Why? Because the days are evil and Jesus Christ is returning soon. We have to be committed to supply the Great Commission. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus told his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, you need to have your eyes on the harvest. You need to be paying attention to the harvest because the harvest is the Lord's. The Lord cares more about the harvest than you do. The Lord cares more about the success of his church than we do. He's passionate about the harvest. He's passionate about reaching people who do not know him in order that they might know him and find freedom and discover their purpose and begin to make a difference with their lives. He's passionate about that. And we have to ask ourselves this question. <clears throat> I just want you to hear me. If you've, if you've zoned out, zone back in for this question, okay? If you're tired of, if you're tired of this uh, non-cute Christmas message, uh, please get over it and listen to me, okay? <laughs> Here's the question we have to ask ourselves. What will I give my life to? What will you give your life to? Either we will use our gifts, our talents, our calling, our resources to advance the gospel and expand the kingdom of God and really be people who are preparing for the return of Jesus Christ. Or 
We can use all of that for ourselves. <clears throat> and to build a platform and try to get people to notice us and try to make a dollar. <clears throat> Which one are we going to choose? Are we going to choose to give ear to what the sound of the season? Are we going to listen to the sounds of the season or are we going to turn a deaf ear? And say, well, that may be good for you. That may be good for somebody else. But it's not good for me. And ignore it. The choice is ours. The choice is ours. What are we going to choose? <clears throat> Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth in a very humble manner. Born in Bethlehem, the Savior of the world, the God of all creation, put on humanity to die for our sins, and to conquer death. And in this, we have hope, we have salvation, because all who turn from their sin and believe upon him will be saved. And this is what Christmas is all about. God with us, hope coming to the world, light penetrating the darkness and coming down. <clears throat> and the sound of the season that I'm here is not only the joy of Christmas, but it's the joy and the anticipa anticipation of God's activity on the earth and the return of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and when he comes back, he's not going to appear again as a little humble baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in Bethlehem. When he comes again, he will come as the risen, the glorified, the sovereign Lord, and our soon coming king. Amen? Amen? Would you stand with me, please? And we'll go ahead and invite our worship team back up as we close. <clears throat> Let's just enter into a time of prayer together this morning. <clears throat> There may be someone here this morning who needs to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. So if you feel the Lord drawing you to come home to him, to place your faith and your trust in him, maybe for the very first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, you just need to recommit yourself to your heavenly father. If that's you, I just want to invite you to pray this prayer after me. There's nothing magical about this prayer, but if you mean it from your heart and you pray it sincerely from your heart, you will be born again and you will be a child of God and you will be assured of your salvation. <clears throat> so I just want to invite everyone to pray this prayer after me and especially if you sense God drawing you to himself this morning. Would you pray after me? Heavenly Father, I repent for being master of my own life and living separate from you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive you today. Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I welcome you, Holy Spirit. Into my life to rescue and empower me. And to restore me to intimacy with my heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Everybody said amen.